Now, some of you may remember, may be older than others. Do you remember Trigger? Do, do, do you know what his real name was? Horse? That's close. Only Clinton could get that one. It was Golden Cloud. The original Trigger lived from 1934 to 1965. I'm sorry, he's not with us anymore. Uh, he was a Palomino horse, and he was owned by and ridden by Roy Rogers. That's right. Uh, what was Roy Rogers' best subject in school? Trigonometry. That's it. Roy Rogers had a son whose name was Dusty. Who would name their kid Dusty? It's got so much been out on it. Roy Rogers' son, Dusty, said of his father, he says, Trigger died and Dad had him stuffed. Now, that's really true. You know that, right? So, Trigger died and Dad had him stuffed. Bullet, you remember Bullet? Bullet died and Dad had him stuffed. Buttermilk died and Dad had him stuffed. You remember Buttermilk? That was his wife's horse, buttermilk. That's right. And now mom keep, sleeps with one eye open. <laughs> you can actually see all those. They're actually in a museum now. Um, Trigger. This is a little different. Marshall Goldsmith uh, wrote this book called Triggers, Creating Behavior That Lasts, Becoming the Person You Want to Be. It's an interesting concept. And, and we would agree with his thinking, at least, if not necessarily his, uh, what he's really trying to accomplish. And that is, uh, what factors can derail us in life? What is it that keeps us from becoming the people we want to be? Are they environmental? Are they personal? What is it? See, triggers often make us react the way we do and often the way we don't want to react. Uh, that annoying neighbor that wakes you up every Saturday morning mowing his lawn at 6 in the morning, right? Or the crazy traffic that you have to face every day on your way to work, right? Or you are the one that's the crazy traffic, I don't know. Or an unexpected call that de detracts you from... Um, your face-to-face -face conversation that was so critical at work and you got distracted, just distracted right at the most critical moment. Now we suddenly may explode and we don't even know why. Have you ever done that? Exploded in anger and you're not even, you weren't even aware that you were that angry and it's happened to you possibly. Uh, are we really that weak in front of such triggers? Are, are we really like that? I mean, what's going on? And these kinds of things uh, end up making us, according to even this book, make us believe that we're out of control. That, that we really can't control who we are. That I can't help that. I couldn't stop that. That's just who I am. And I can't get control of it. And we tell ourselves things like that. But Marshall Goldsmith's main reproach in this book is it is in our power to control ourselves and how we act and how we react even when we have to deal with what we would call spontaneous events that we were not expecting. So you say, well, I, I, I couldn't have anticipated that. But that doesn't mean it's out of our control of how we react. Goldsmith shows how we can overcome triggers, what we might call triggers that we are more susceptible to than maybe other people. There are certain triggers that fire you off or make you weaker or make you want to give in to sin, maybe in ways that don't affect other people. He talks about processes. Uh, according to his theory, many overcome, we, we can overcome our triggers if we'd understand these and use these processes. He talks about self-monitoring, uh, that we're superior planners in life. I mean, most of you got a list, right? 
of something you're planning on doing. Almost everybody's got a list, right? Everybody's got something. Jot it down. I got to do this. I got to do this. I got to do this. And you know about what order. So we're really good as human beings, great planners, but often we're inferior doers when the environment suddenly shifts on us. Uh, but the magic bullet, according to uh, Marshall, he, he seems to believe is simply self-monitoring, uh, using engaging questions to measure our effort, not our result. We can't always fix that, but we can measure our effort. And that's what one of the su suggestions. But here's some questions he said, and you just put some of these in your head. Did, did I do my best to set clear goals? Did I do my best to progress toward goals that were achievable? Did I do my best to find meaning in what I was doing? Did I do my best to be happy? Did I do my best to build positive relationships? Did I do my best to, to be fully engaged in what was going on? Those are just some general things. And he's saying if we would monitor ourselves and continually ask ourselves that question, we would probably handle these interruptions, these surprise engagements that often are the triggers that mess us around. So he also said self-missioning, this idea of keeping yourself on track. Successful people uh, that are used to winning uh, may risk mismanaging uh, their emotions when faced with environmental triggers. So they may be great, successful in life, but when these triggers come, they do just as bad as the rest of us. They may be very successful people, but right here. So what he suggests is we need, even successful people need to center on what's really important and ask these kind of questions. What's my mission? Keep asking yourself, what is my mission? Uh, who's the customer? Uh, what does the customer consider uh, to be valuable? What's the goal? What's my goal right now? What's the plan? Why am I doing this? So you just keep trying to keep yourself on mission, self-missioning. So self-monitoring and self-missioning. And then a third one he mentioned was self-motivating. See, success, he said, is like a sport. And to succeed, we have to practice every day. Some of our teams haven't been practicing enough, but maybe the Bucks will practice a little more of this. To build something great takes daily small efforts. The Great Wall of China did not go up in a day. 1,700 years. That's a long time to build on something, isn't it? Small efforts lead us to success, like commitment, self-control, patience. So living in regret and a sense of failure only causes you to probably commit more failures. However, regret is not a bad thing because regret, regret harnessed can lead to real apology and real change. There's a lot of people, probably even people in this room, that need to learn how to apologize to other people in this room. And a proper apology would make a big change in the way you approach things. So regret is not all that bad. But he did, did say that overnight change is just a myth. Nobody changes overnight. Nobody obeys the gospel and is a, a great Christian that needs to be made an elder within two weeks. That just doesn't happen. But in that same context, he said, Therefore, since that is the case, regret can be a good thing. And since that is the case, it takes a long time. Encourage yourself. You haven't become perfect overnight, but you've made some improvement. Look back a little bit. You have made improvement. Encourage yourself, and you'll do better. So those are some things he just suggested that I thought were pretty good. Self-monitoring, self-missioning, and self-motivating. But we are not. The point is that we are not slaves to this cycle that we seem to be in. Once we know it exists, that there is a cycle, we can resist it. And that's what James said a minute ago. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away. Okay, there is a drawing away. That's a part of the process. Uh, by his own desires. And then enticed. That's another. So you're drawn away first. And then you are enticed. And then when desire has conceived. That's another part of the process. The desire conceives itself into what it will do, and it gives birth to sin. Then it doesn't, 
and sin when it's full grown brings forth death. If you allow it to have its way, it can destroy you. So that's kind of the process. We know it's a process, it's a cycle. We're not ignorant. You know, triggers result uh, as an impulse which results in a behavior. This is usually the cycle that we see and we think it's spontaneous and we think we can't do anything about it, but it's not true. We are not ignorant of this process. We just choose to act like we're ignorant. Hello? We, we like acting like we're ignorant so that we can get away with our little misbehaviors. Can I get an amen? Yeah, that's, I should have got a better amen. But I'll take that. 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 11 says, Lest Satan should take advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. We know this process goes on. And we know we can stand against it. Ephesians 6 and verse 11 says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks of the devil. We know that we can do it. And we know that we can resist. James 4, 7 says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So we know we can resist, right? We know we've done it before, right? Now, but we like to say we can't. So I want to give you, uh, and th this is by no means the list, okay? These are the things that jumped out at me as I was considering, okay, what are the triggers that lead me to do things that I really shouldn't do, right? And so maybe they'll be helpful to you. I want to give you five spiritual triggers. Number one, they're all there at the, simultaneously. The trigger of excesses. It says in 1 Corinthians 9, it says, do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain. And everyone who is confident for the prize is temperate, or another way of saying that, self-control, or another way of saying it, is moderate. It doesn't mean you don't do it. It means you do things in moderation and you control it. You understand what I'm saying? That's the idea of temperate. You do it, you eat, but you control it. You do get mad, but you control it. Temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. So what we're talking about here is excesses. You, got, you, you can't stop eating. You ever notice this on dieting? You know, people say, well, uh, I quit smoking. Well, it's a little different because you don't have to smoke to live, but you do have to eat to live. It's a little different, isn't it? You're going to have to keep eating. So how do you do it? It's a little different. You don't have to do every addiction, but you do have to know that there are addictions, there are habits, there's cravings, there's fetishes, and it's like that old saying. You remember the old Lay's potato chip? No one can... He just wants. See, that's the problem, isn't it? That's the problem. So what we have to learn to do is participate in stuff without becoming excessive. And that excess, that first excess, leads to worse excesses. And that's a trigger for us in almost everything we want to talk about. You get angry, but it's when you know you've gone just a little bit further and you don't stop yourself. You know you're just a little beyond where you ought to be. Your voice is going a little bit higher, but you don't stop yourself there. Number two, the trigger of thorns. In 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7 it says this, that, and lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Now thorns in the Bible have a bunch of different connotations. They have the idea of piercing obviously and that goes all the way back to the garden as a part of the curse but it also carries with it the idea of an irritation and if you ever get a thorn in you, ever had got one in you and it broke off the end of it and you couldn't get it out right and it just it's there so it not only irritated and every time you got close to it you know, that piece of wood or whatever just irritated. But then it festered up, right? So it festers. So thorns tend to fester within you. And then it also can choke good fruit, right? We know that from the 
parable of the sower. But the point that I want to make is, is that these things are things that just irritate you. I'll tell you something. Uh, we would, it's one of the triggers in our life, things that pierce us, just irritate, niggle us along. Yeah. Yeah, just things. And what's happening? How do you overcome that? You either have to get rid of it or you have to ignore it. You have to get rid of it or you have to ignore it. You either pull that thing out and get rid of it or you have to learn to ignore the thorn and move on. And that's how you stop it. Don't let it fester and become something worse because there's a lot of little things that are justified for the way you blow up at other people. And blowing up at other people is a work of the flesh, Galatians chapter 5. Number three, the trigger of weights. There are weights that are upon us. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 1. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. There are weights around us. And those become triggers to us. Some of you are burdened. You are burdened so much that you cannot even tell your mate how burdened you are. You carry a burden. It may be a financial burden. It may be a medical burden. It may be an emotional burden. It may be the burden of your mate themselves. They may have ceased to try to be a good mate, and now they are only a burden to you. They have given up. There are stresses that can be upon you. Stresses of work, stresses of finances, stresses of relationships, and they can just, legalism can be a burden. Church can end up being a burden. You can go to church and hate every minute of it and then try to act like you're enjoying it. Then you can, you can be burdened by your business. Your business alone can be such a burden that when you come home, you can't even leave it at work. You, most of you probably are salary type workers and, and you, you don't leave it. It's still on you. You get home and you're still thinking about it. Well, how could I have done that better? And it's still on you. And, and that creates triggers for things that go on in the home. So I'm just suggesting that there are weights that cause a lot of our issues. Fourthly, there's the trigger of snares. Snares. Hebrews 12 goes on to say, uh, and therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now, a snare, I don't know if you country people enough to know what a snare is. It's just a string, right? It's a string with a loop on it tied to a stick or a rock or a tree. And you create a loop that hangs on some bushes and a little animal goes through there and because he ends up tripping on the string, it pulls it around and tightens up and chokes a little animal to death and now you got dinner. I'm sorry. That's country folks, I'm sorry, that's a snare. It's what it is, okay, I'm sorry. And so, but people have snares. People get into snares. They creep around thinking they're gonna get away with something and then they get hooked by something. They're the ones that get ensnared. Uh, they played with the flypaper, wanting to eat the sweet that's on it, and their feet got stuck to it. Um, there are nooses around your neck. There are traps. There's, there's tricks. You've been tricked. There's Some of you have been tricked into financial woes. Somebody got you to go along, maybe make an investment, and now it's taking everything you've got, and you still haven't made anything. It's, there's all kinds of nooses that can happen to people and tricks and snares, but sins like that. You think you can go play with it and it won't have an effect on you and then it gets a hold of you and you can't let go of it and you don't know how to let go of it. So you have to avoid the snares before you get trapped by them because once you're in it, the little animal has got no idea that it's pulling is what's making it worse. You've got to head toward the noose and that's the only way out. But they don't get that. 
And a lot of us don't know it either. But then number five, there's the trigger of gateways. In Matthew 7 and verse 13 it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads, so this gateway leads. It's not destruction. You don't go in and you're destroyed. That's not what it says. It leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. So it starts off when you first do some things, they're just gateway things. You just start, you, it's a, a small leak in a boat. It's not a problem, but left long enough, a small leak in your roof, not a problem. Fix it, go up there and put something on it right there, but leave it. You got a wall or part of the roof to replace or your whole house gets mildewed and then you get some kind of virus or something and you, you die. I mean, Legionnaire's disease. I mean, anything can happen. You just can't leave it. Small leaks become problems. Little possessions. So you let the devil in. You give him a place. And so he has a little possession. And then maybe you get rid of it and you think you're clear. And he goes and gets seven more devils more wicked than that and comes on in. And now you really are in a mess. So it leads to something else. A little sin leads to a bigger sin. Leads to a bigger sin. When you're talking about lust, lust has a capacity that you get used to a lust and now you try another lust and then you get used to that and then you got to have more and more and that's the way sin betrays you and then there's small self-deceptions where you justify what you're doing and you talk yourself into oh I'm justified in what I'm doing and then you do just a little bit more and then you justify that and then you do a little bit more and you justify that the next thing you know you can be the biggest criminal on the planet and justify everything you've done you can commit murder and justify it and say they deserved it you can self deceive yourself in almost anything so let's change and become better and identifying the triggers, whatever yours are. And, and I'm just saying that if we could just identify that sometimes it's the little excesses, it's those little thorns that are niggling us that we let blow up, and it's those little burdens that, that we don't deal with, and it's those snares that grab us and we don't cut the cord, there's that little gateway thing that we do, and when, when next thing you know, we're justifying everything we're doing. We're cursing at people. We're cursing at people in the traffic. We're talking inappropriately to people. We're saying mean things. We're getting angry. Or we're justifying cheating at school. Or we're justifying cheating in business because we've all justified Because we, well, we went this far, and it was just a little bit further. And then the next thing we know, we don't even recognize ourselves. So one thing tends to lead to another. One sin leads to a worse sin. But it doesn't have to be that way. We're not fools. We know the system. We know the tricks of the devil. And we know we have free will. Amen? Um, we therefore, if we wish, we can know our triggers and avoid them. Uh, this week, I'm on steroids. Arnold Schwarzenegger. No, uh, I've got a sinus thing I'm dealing with. So I have been aware, and you, maybe you don't know this, but on steroids, I, I'm really a friendly guy sometimes. But on steroids, I'm a little bit snippy. So I have been very alert to that since I've been on it. Don't ask my wife. But I have been very alert to it, trying to not be, you know what I mean? Uh, Frederick Nietzsche said this, He who has a why, he who has a why for life can put up with any how. Victor Frankl was uh, in the concentration camps in Germany. And he endured the degradation, the abject misery. But even in the middle of that, he developed the ability to stand aloof. He determined that he maintained the freedom to control his attitude and his spiritual well-being. No sadistic Nazi SS guard was able to take that away from him or control his inner life of the soul. He wrote the following 
um, being marched to a forced labor camp in Nazi concentration uh, situation. And here's what he wrote. And it's a little lengthy, but I think it's worth it. We stumbled on in the darkness over big stones and through large puddles. Now this, this is real. It's not make-believe. This is all really the way it happened, okay? We stumbled on in the darkness over big stones and through large puddles along the one road running through the camp. The accompanying guards kept shouting at us and driving us with the butts of their rifles. Anyone with very sore feet supported himself on his neighbor's arms. Hardly a word spoken. The icy wind did not encourage talking. Hiding his hand behind his upturned collar, the man marching next to me whispered, If our wives could see us now, I do hope they're better off in their camps and don't know what is happening to us. That brought thoughts of my own wife to my mind. And as we stumbled on for miles, slipping on icy spots, supporting each other time and again, dragging one another on and upward, nothing was said, but we both knew. Each of us was thinking of his wife. Occasionally I looked at the sky where the stars were fading and the pink light of the morning was beginning to spread behind a dark uh, bank of clouds. But my mind clung to my wife's image, imagining it with an uncanny acuteness. I heard her answering me, saw her smile, her frank and encouraging look. Real or not, her look then was more luminous than the sun which was beginning to rise. I thought, a thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and the highest goal to which men can aspire. Then I grasped the meaning of the greatest secret that human poetry and human thought and belief have to impart. The salvation is ma of man is through love and in love. I understood how a man who has nothing left in this world may still know bliss, but it's only for a brief moment in the contemplation of his beloved. In a position of utter, utter desolation, when a man cannot express himself in positive action, when he only, his only achievement may consist in enduring his sufferings in the right way, an honorable way, in such a position man can, through loving contemplation of the image he carries of his beloved, achieve fulfillment. For the first time in my life, I was able to understand the words, the angels are lost in perpetual contemplation of an infinite glory. The front of me, a man stumbled, and those following him fell on top of him. The guard rushed over and used his whip over them all. Thus my thoughts were interrupted for a few minutes, but soon my soul found its way back from the prisoner's existence to another world, and I resumed talk with my loved one. I asked her questions, and she answered. She questioned me in return, and I answered. My mind still clung to the image of my wife. A thought crossed my mind. I didn't even know if she were still alive, and I had no means of finding out. During all my prison life, there was no outgoing or incoming mail. But at that moment, it ceased to matter. There was no need to know. Nothing could touch the strength of my love and the thoughts of my beloved. Had I known then that my wife was dead, I think that I still would have given myself undisturbed by that knowledge to the contemplation of that in image and that my mental conversation with her would have been just as vivid and just as satisfying. Set me like a seal upon thy heart. Love is as strong as death. Everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. When we are so, no longer able to change the situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. Between stimulus and response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. In our response lies our growth and our freedom. So sitting there tonight, you may think you can't change, but you already have. God got a hold of you if you're a Christian tonight, and you already have. You can change. You do not have to give in to these triggers. You can watch for them, and you can make changes and not let them get at you. Amen? 
So if you're here tonight and you're willing to give your life to the Lord, it won't happen overnight, but eventually you'll get to a place that you'll feel better about who you are. Amen? So you can obey the gospel, believe in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins, confess His name, and be baptized tonight. The invitation is yours if you would have it right now as we stand and as we sing.